The Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. EliteForum.com and IgnitionAPG.com. And now, the Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast. Welcome to Iron Game Chalk Talk with your host, Ron McKeefrey. Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! Everything you got! On this podcast, hear Coach McKeefrey straight talk about training, featuring the top strength and conditioning professionals from around the world. And now, here's your host, Ron McKeefrey. Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Ron McKeefrey, and this is episode number 58. Iron Game Chalk Talk is a weekly podcast where I bring you experts in the field to talk shop. If you're not already done so, please subscribe to us on iTunes or YouTube or join our mailing list at ronmckeefrey.com so we can keep you up to date with the latest episodes and anything else that we have going on. This week, real excited to have Rob Rogers with us. Rob is a good buddy of mine. I've known him for uh, ever since, the I think, the first year I was at South Florida, so over you know, 16, 17 years now. Um, spoke at a conference that we held at, at South Florida and uh, really has been a, a, a good friend and good mentor through the years. Uh, one of the more creative guys that I know and uh, he's, he's really done it all. He's been uh, you know, a strength coach for uh, Baylor and USC and Middle Tennessee, uh, the, Chicago, the, the St. Louis Blues, uh, worked most recently in tactical strength and conditioning uh, both at the NSCA headquarters and and in uh, with special forces, the tenth group and 160th SOAR and things along those lines. And so we 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 spent a lot of time talking about the pluses and minuses of the different uh, paths that you can take as a, as a strength and conditioning coach. Uh, we talk about how to prepare yourself for the ups and downs uh, of this business. And, and then we spent some time talking about program design elements for the tactical athlete and how that's an aspect or, or a path that strength coaches can take in their own communities and really make an impact. So uh, I know you're going to get a ton out of this episode. Before we get started, I want to recognize Elite Form and IgnitionAPG.com for sponsoring the show. Please reach out to these guys. Let them know how much you appreciate them helping bring this show to you for free. Uh, Elite Form is a sports science company out in Nebraska uh, doing some really, really cool things with technology. Uh, you know, basically it is a camera system that you're able to give visual feedback built in with a Tendo where you're able to get some velocity information. And, uh, and then they have their paperless system and their strength planner where you're able to push workouts both to the rack and then to, to any kind of mobile device or computer that you may have. And so... I would encourage you to check them out, uh, like their Facebook page. They're constantly putting great information out, like how the Eagles and other great programs are using their products. They have a free trial of their strength planner. At, if you email IGCT at EliteForm.com, they will send you a free 30-day trial. Um, definitely worth the, the, op- the opportunity to check it out, try it out. Definitely a time saver, something that I really appreciate as a strength coach and uh, I know you will too so check out eliteform.com lastly if you love these podcasts I know you'll enjoy strength on demand strength on demand is a product that Rob Taylor and myself created it is a online archive of strength and conditioning clinic presentations that we're able to gather uh, we're constantly updating it and uh, you know it's a, it's a yearly subscription or it's a it's a lifetime subscription uh, only $97 right now, and there's well over 50 strength and conditioning clinic presentations and, and being added to uh, each and every year. So check out strength-on, strength-ondemand.com, and uh, I know you'll enjoy that as well. So I want to get to Rob Rogers. Great episode, lots of good information in there, especially uh, about the longevity in this profession, which we're all striving for. And... Um, I know you're going to take lots of notes, so sit back and enjoy. Take care. All right, guys. Excited to have a good friend of mine, a guy I've known for a long time, Rob Rogers with us. Rob's been an instrumental guy in my career. He's been a guy that I've been able to go to uh, for questions for probably, what, probably 15 years now? Oh, yeah. We've we've known each other forever, it seems like. (laughs) 
but he's definitely a guy that, that I've learned from. Got all his books and videos and everything on my on my bookshelf. So, man, I appreciate you coming on the show. I, I'm really honored to be a part of this. I appreciate what you're doing for the industry and for the young coaches, Coach. Thanks a lot, man. You know, hey, let's talk a little bit about your journey because, you know, I, I've been with you for a long time now, and, and, and I've seen the, the, the path, and it's been a, a, a different path. It's been all over, you know, all over the place to some degree. Talk about why you got into strength and conditioning and where, you know, what, what's kind of led you to where you're at now and your, this point in your career. When I was a kid, I was going to grow up and be a pro football player, you know, but there's no <laughs> five foot, six inch, five, two, forty guys in the NFL, to, to my knowledge. <laughs> I mean, I've checked, but I've never seen one that's actually made it. So uh, along the way, I was going to be a football coach. And then this was in the early 80s, and it was right at the beginning of strength conditioning. And I had a, I was working as a strength conditioning coach at Missouri State University. And we, they didn't have strength coaches, but they had a new weight room, and they asked me to kind of monitor it. <laughs> so I was the strength coach. So me and a guy named Mike Murphy, who came back to finish his career at the uh, get his degree, he was playing professionally. And so as soon as he got his degree after one semester, they immediately ran out of money. But I could stay on and volunteer, but they didn't pay <laughs> money now that Mike was gone. So I stayed on for the next year and a half and coached there. And uh, had a clinic, and Russ Ball came up from uh, Columbia, Missouri. He had just been named the head strength coach, and um, George Williford was at Arkansas, and he came up from Fayetteville. And we had a clinic for the area coaches, and one thing led to another, and I started working for Russ at Missouri. Was a GA, um, was a part-time assistant, became a full-time assistant. When I left there, I was 30 years old, had my master's. In 1989, I was making $13,000 a year, <laughs> had, had no benefits. Wow. So, you know, it wasn't about the money. It's never been about the money. I'm a teacher and a coach. You know, I, it, that's all I do. And so as time went on, uh, one of my mentors, Bob Cope, who passed away a few years ago from cancer, Bob told me one time, he says, does he have 13 years experience or does he have one year experience 13 times? And I started <laughs> laughing. I said, well, that's a good point, Bob. I said, so I've had the opportunity to have, you know, over 30 years, really, of, of true experience. Right. So I've been at Missouri State as a student coach. I've been at Missouri as a GA and a full-time assistant. I became Mike Clark's assistant. Mike's with the Bears now. Mike's assistant at SC. He left. I, Larry Smith gave me my first opportunity to be a head strength coach at USC. Uh, we had an athletic director that kept cutting our budget. We went to three Rose Bowls in a row, and all of a sudden we got to start a bunch of freshmen and stuff. And you know, and we we battled through that. Came back the next year. We we're second in the league, and that wasn't good enough. So we all got fired. So. That was fine. You know, I worked for Coach Robinson for a week and had an opportunity to go to Baylor. So Coach Taft hired me at Baylor. I worked for Chuck Reedy. We went through two presidents, three athletic directors, two investigations in basketball. Uh, one was a gender equity with the women, and the other was NC2A violations with the basketball coaches. And uh, went through, let's see, I was on my second football coach. And at seven and a half years there, we had a $465,000 endowment that me and wow. one guy set up there. So our weight room, Nebraska's weight room and A&M's weight room were the only three in the nation that actually made money. We actually made money. Wow. You know, you take salaries out of it. You know, we made money. So we, we had an endowment set up there and it, you know, it was time for me to go, go because they wanted to go another direction. So they did. And it took them, I think, 16 years to get back into a bowl game and, 20 years to win the conference again. So they went another direction, so died. So I left there and uh, spent a year in the NHL. Uh, good friend of mine who I really respect, and I know you do too, Mike Boyle, was instrumental in keeping my career going and gave me the opportunity to have an opportunity to interview, and I went with the St. Louis Blues. And I still stay in contact with their trainer and equipment guy, great professional guys. But pro hockey was not for me. Yeah. I was not coaching. I'm a coach. Right. So after a year, I took a financial beating, left hockey, went to Middle Tennessee State with a bunch of guys that are now in the league and in head coaches, Larry Fedora over at North Carolina, and, and my boss was Andy McCollum, who's down at Georgia Tech, got to work with some great coaches. And our third year there, we're fourth, fifth in the nation of all the Division One teams on offense, yep. we're in the nation, Middle Tennessee State. We're Middle Tennessee. We're not even a directional school. <laughs> so we had a great run there. But like always happens, you know, you're going to move on. Right. So as a young coach, you're going to win, move, lose, and move. But you better get ready to move because that's going to happen. It's like the military. 
the average is probably somewhere between two and three years for, for a coach in strength conditioning. So, you know, then I, I left there and I went to a private place, got to work with race car drivers, uh, the, the fever, the Indianapolis fever, and they wanted to become, you know, on par with athletes performance or now exos. And they wanted to kind of fight with those guys and be a, be a competitor to those guys. But that's what they thought they wanted to be. And then come to find out that's not who they wanted to be. And I was hired like, and then it was like, well, you don't fit in here anymore. So I had an opportunity to leave, went to work for the NSCA. Worked there for a couple of years, um, was a 30-year member. By the time I left there, I'm not a member anymore. Um, it was founded by some guys that were 30 years ago were fired because of skimming money. And I, you know, I don't know exactly what's going on there now. I'm not there. Can't mm-hmm. tell you. But I, I'll just say I'm not a member anymore. So <laughs> not to, you know, never say anything bad about anybody. I'm just not a member. So I left there and then I started in the military. Uh, helped them stand that up a little bit from my chair at the NSCA because I was doing the tactical stuff. Worked with those guys. It was a great deal. So, you know, it's my opportunity to serve my country. And it was, you know, hey, this thing's funded for the next five years. The money's in place for over three years. You know, uh, um, we're going to, you know, we, we're going to have GSs. Uh, we want you to be a GS. Ended up I wasn't a GS. I was a contract guy. Okay, no big deal. I still get to con- uh, contribute. So, hey, you know, first in, last out. Uh, oh, the budget's cut, program slashed. It's not first in, last out. So everything I was told by SOCOM from the time it stood up till now, um, let's just say changed along the way for whatever reason can take. Right. So now, you know, same thing. I'm 35 years in into my career. I'm 55 years old. I can still coach. I still have a great eye. I still can cue. I can still do all that. Sure. But it's it's a young man's game. Right. So I'm getting ready to go for the next opportunity, whatever that is in the next few months. So that's kind of been how my career's worked out. Yeah. Well, obviously you shared a little bit, but you know, the, 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 of going through the, the ups and downs of this business, but what, what, have, what have been some of the positives and the negatives of the different opportunities? I mean, you know, cause it's strength and conditioning now. I mean, like when you, when you first got in, when we first got in, you know, you were the personal trainer, your strength coach, you know, and then now all of a sudden now there's all these different, racing and strength and conditioning and, and tactical strength and conditioning and you know, all these different facets and you've been in a lot of them what are, what are the positives and the, and the negatives of the different areas i think the specialization has really really grown in our sport and we're starting to or in our profession rather and we're starting to really understand what it takes to train uh, groups and individuals at really really high levels and really streamline the process of their ability to improve their tools, speed, strength, power, quickness, and those things. But along the lines, the game has all, it, 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 the profession in the game has changed. Every sport has changed over the last 20 years. You know, before, when I started in 80, they were just happy to have somebody in the weight room to show them how to do stuff correctly. Right. And then, then you gave them summer books, and it was like everybody had a summer book. And I've got a collection that's, I got a collection of like 40 summer books from all these guys throughout their careers in history. And you look back, and you're like, oh. That's some great stuff. That's right. Now somebody puts it out like, oh, this is my stuff. You're like, no, it's not. That was that was Jerry Attaway's at UCLA in 1978. You're That's like, right. it was Jerry Attaway, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, so that changed. And then all of a sudden, uh, periodization came on board. So we're not telling them sets and reps. We're also telling them loads. So we started to understand that the more control we have, the faster the process is of train hard, eat right, rest and recover. Right. So all of a sudden now I have this more control. So it became it became periodization. Then the next thing was nutrition. And then the next thing was speed and agility and acceleration, change of direction. And then it became injury prevention. We gotta keep the best people on the field. And then it became, you know, sports psych. And then it and now now like we were talking off offline before, now I think it's becoming the next thing is how do I train my athlete that we don't have control of where they are today. So like, like, and I don't understand it all yet because I'm not deep into this part of it, but like the Omega Wave evidently tells you kind of where you are right now today when you walk in the room. So you get a baseline on a guy or a girl and then you train them and you've got systems like the catapult system that you know what kind of workload they did in terms of speed and, and meters covered and that kind of thing. Right. And then you cross-reference that with their heart rate stuff and now you know how they responded to that workload. And so now... All of a sudden, a guy 
you know, one of your top players comes in three days in a row and, and his resting rate when he walks in the door is elevated. And then it, this, this normal Tuesday and this normal Wednesday workout that, you know, the pattern's the same because right, right. we're playing football. So we're going to play on Saturday unless, you know, you're at this school and you're going to play on Thursday, Saturday, Monday, Sunday, and right. Tuesday. <laughs> but let's say you're playing every week and, and all of a sudden now you're playing there and, and he's res his heart rate response is up 10 or 15%. Now, in two days, you know that there's something going on with that cat. That's right. Rather than wait until after the game and he has a poor performance. So you can maybe intervene and maybe he's getting sick. Maybe he's got uh, ac academic stuff. Maybe he's got social stuff. Uh, you know, maybe it's drug stuff. Who knows? But you know within 48 hours. And where it's going now is you're, you're going to end up with a performance director who is, you know, he's kind of collecting all this. And you're going to have a metrics guy. Right. And all he does is numbers. That's all he does. Yeah. Just like you get an injury report, you're going to get a status report on every player and what they've done workload-wise and how they responded to it during the course of the week. And what it's going to do is it's it's where we're going to sell it is player safety. Yep. Because now, you know, hey, this guy's at risk. He's not recovering, Coach, mm -hmm. for whatever reason. We don't know. Is it sickle cell? Is he tested? You know, all these reasons. Now at least you have concrete data to go back on. So. Yep. That's no, what I think is going on. I think you're right. I think the high performance model, that that Olympic sport model, um, is definitely uh, is is trending right now, and, and it's definitely an area I think we need to be gearing a lot of our resources towards. I've always said, you know, I've said it on the show several times that, you know, the problem with our profession is, in a lot of ways, it's not truly a profession if, if we're not retiring doing what we love to do, you know. And, um, you know, I, I, I spoke at the CSCCA conference a, a couple of years back and had everybody stand up and, and, and sit down if they couldn't name more than five people that retired doing what we're doing, you know, and, and, and the whole room sat down, you know. And, and so, you know, the challenge, I think, for us is to find ways to continue to, to uh, provide opportunities for our, our aging strength coaches um, and our, you know, yeah, I know, right? You're laughing. Yeah, I'm, I'm I got I got my heart card, Ronnie. I'm looking at me too now, you know, and and, uh, and 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 an entry point for our young strength coaches, you know, and so my, I've always said that I think that we really should be pushing towards that high performance manager, or really that associate athletic director in charge of strength and conditioning, sports performance, you know, and that be the home for a lot of our coaches when the football coach wants to make a new decision or you know whatever. Um, so we're pushing towards that. So we also have a voice in our in the administration. So I think that opens jobs there. And I think, you know, we should really be pushing to mandate a high school strength and conditioning coach in every high school and, and think about the opportunity there for both coaches that don't want to move. You know, they're at, they're at that point in their right. career where they, I just want to deal with, I, you know, I just want to stay in the same spot and coach kids. Or that young strength coach getting in the field where they're allowed to make the mistakes at a less a pressured environment. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think those are the two areas that we really need to be focused on, but you, know, you brought in, you know, you brought up a great point, you know, that, 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 that the field has changed quite a bit from when you got in, from when I got in to what it is now, you know, and, and you mentioned it's a, it's a young man's game. What, what are some of the things that our young strength coaches or our strength coaches just getting into the field, what should they be doing to protect themselves so that when they are 55 or, or when they're. 39 and they're 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 let go what what should they be doing and they're, and they're, and they're in a position where they can handle it the, the key to me is is networking and network you got to work on networking daily it's yeah. like recruiting you got to work on it daily you, you just you don't pick the phone up when you need it need something right. you pick the phone up or you drop a handwritten note or you send an email and say hey coach you, you know this happened today it made me think of you you know hope everything's going well because that keeps that if, – if they, if they don't see you, out of sight, out of mind. Yep. I, I mean, I, I know a guy that was let go in the military uh, that had been there three and a half years. But he's a real quiet guy, doesn't communicate a lot. He just does his job, helps the individuals. And there was another guy that had only been there two and a half months. But he every day he was emailing command with this happened that happened. They kept the guy that had been there two months rather than the guy that had been there three and a half years training the guys. Yeah. 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 And they were like, well, uh, we just, uh, you know, we just, uh, this, you know, that's, yeah, we just kept this other guy. They couldn't say why. <laughs> no. But because he was in front of them every day on an email, and the other guy was like, well, so this guy has to be better. Well, that goes back to what I've, I've said several times on the show as well is that, you know, the, the, the fundamental problem 
that I, I think that we're facing is that we have not defined how we should be evaluated to our superiors. Hey Amen. I've, I've said that to multiple coaches, multiple athletic directors. Yeah. I, think I, I, can, I can't tell you how many interviews I've been on as a strength coach. Never once have I been put on a grease board. Yeah. Never by a sport coach, by an administrator, or by another coach. I've never been put on a grease board. That's the first thing a football coach is. Yep. Yeah, you know, show me how you attack press coverage. You know, I mean, that's the first thing they do. Put them on the board and let's go to the board. Let's spend two or three hours with that. Right. It, it's the, here's how street coaching works. Are you a good guy? Are you easy to dance with? I give him an 85. Let's keep him. Unless <laughs> somebody that has two commas in their check says, no, let's do it this way. That's exactly how it works. For the young kids, the young guys, the young professionals, young coaches, it doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter. What matters is who you're with, where you are, are you coming in in the beginning, or is somebody else coming in and starting anew? Because you'll be here, there, or yonder, and it has nothing to do with how professionally good you are. Or the, or the challenge to, the, to that same demographic is to change it. You know, to change it and try to find ways to provide that answer of how to evaluate a strength coach or provide a framework in which, the, you know, you have some stability or – I, you know, I got I got basically almost booed off the stage, but you know, my 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 contention was I think strength conditioning is a, is an art. It's an art. It's just like it's like being it's like you know running a four three versus a you know whatever. You know, you you have your style, you have your philosophy, you have your art. You know, make us part of the coaching staffs. You know, yeah. and and you know, just instead of it being the the, the not, you know nine football coaches, make it ten football coaches. But instead of coaching quarterbacks, I coach strength. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and, that's how it works, and it, it's it's a science, just like X's and O's is a absolutely, science. Absolutely. But the application is an art. That's right. No question it's an art. That's you right. know, that's why those guys make that much money. That's and right. if you tie it into, you know, let's say that you tie it into um, uh, one of the parameters is uh, injury rate. Is your injury rate trending up or trending down? Yeah. Well, what, I don't was it, be... what was it before you got there? When I was at Middle Tennessee, which is where the last place I was in college – where the system had finally started to evolve to this elite level where we were doing stuff that people would be like, how do, how do you do all that? Be like, right. well, it's just, you just layers. Every year you add a little a right. layer. We had no major surgeries for three years. No shoulders, no knees, no backs, no ankles. We had a couple of scopes during that time, but we had a scope on an ankle. We had a, a, a scope, two scopes on knees and that was it. Yeah. I, I think that, but you know, with that, to be fair, that the hard part of that is that you have to have a lot of people on board for that. You have to have the trainer, you have to have the football, you know, the coaching staffs. You know, I mean, if they're they're going out and they're beating them, in, you know, into the ground for two and a half hours, then then you are going to have some of those injuries. You're, you're always going to have injuries. Yeah. So you don't. It's like it's like the strength coach saying, "Yeah, yeah." When I got there, we won this and we won that, and I put these guys in the league. No, you didn't. Yeah. They recruited them. They were great players. Right. You didn't screw them up. You helped them along the way. No so our impact to winning and losing is somewhere in the 3 to 5% range, I, I'm guessing, thinking. Right. But we do contribute to that, no question, over the course of time. No, no question. And, and, and like I you know, made the same argument that you know, the role of a strength coach has far exceeded just the X's and O's and, and the application of lifting weights. It's It's been the sports psych and the relationships and the team building and – on and on and on, and and I think that's where again I think we got to look back at what we do and redefine our job description and and uh, and challenge some people on it and, and and be able to really push forward. But you know I, I know this is uh, something that you and I are both passionate about. But to kind of switch gears a little bit, you know, talk, the the tactical side of strength and conditioning, I think that that's an area that obviously is getting a lot more attention right now. Um, but I think there's tremendous opportunity when you start to when you start to add in fire and SWAT and police and, and, you know, the opportunities that lie in that for potential strength coaches to go in their own communities and, and develop programs and systems. What, what is that program design? You know, what, 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 are the, what are the biggest challenges in that environment? And then what would a normal week look like? A couple of things. Um, uh, first of all, it, it's a growing part of our industry. Mm -hmm. uh, slow growing, but gl growing. There's metro areas that are hiring strength coaches. So for first responders 
And where you have to show that it works is you have to you have to have them commit to a three to five year deal. Because at the end of three to five years, somewhere in that window, that last two years, you're going to actually be able to prove that, one, you're putting people back in service faster than they were before when they are injured. Mm. And two, the overall injury rate is dropping because that goes back to workman's comp. And workman's comp is how you justify your salary. But they have to, at the beginning, John Hoffman's a good friend of mine. He does firefighter fitness online. He is the head strength coach for Sacramento Fire in California, and he has actually run the numbers, and he justifies, he, he makes, he saves them 60 grand a year. That also happens to be his salary. It just worked out that way. But that's how it worked. He'd he probably be pissed because I told everybody his salary. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, he, he has done an outstanding job. He has changed their medical physicals out there so that now they're getting stuff done proactively so they know when to step in and keep these guys healthier longer and then not have to pay as much or any disability when the guys are retiring. And that's the whole mindset of that plus the tactical. With When you're working like with the SWAT team, I got to work with our SWAT team here in town, great professional guys here in Colorado Springs. They're a full-time SWAT team. There's not many of them around the United States. There's maybe 15, 16 of them. Mm-hmm. Most of them are dual-duty SWAT guys so or women. So uh, these SWAT guys are full time, twenty four seven. You can't smoke them till there's no gas left in the tank. That's right. It could be on the last round of the last part of the circuit, and the beepers go off. They got to go. Yep. So you can't take them to that level. So what you're doing is you're training for a career. So like a long term athlete program, like a four year Olympic cycle, where you've got world championship, world championship, world championship, Olympics. Yeah. And you have to peak every year for those different things. Now you've got a 20-year window. So how do I set up some form of periodization for that? So now I roll in strength for six, eight weeks. And then I roll in fitness for six, eight weeks. And then I roll in speed power for six, eight weeks. And then I roll in maybe a mobility, stability, injury prevention, more focus for a month. And then I start back again. And that's how I roll in this long-term warrior or a long-term first responder programming so that nothing is ever taken completely out, but I change the emphasis of my focus on those three or four little parameters so that I have some form of periodization because, like, your guys kind of have to show up, right? Yeah. The other guys don't have to. Right. So now the SWAT guys get a call out, and they're out. They're awake for 36 hours. They're not going to be in for the next day. Right. They're only training with me two days a week, for instance. So your periodization is very, very loosely based. Yeah. A week, like with the military guys, okay, football is, if you're, near the, if you're near the ball, if you're a front seven guy, you don't cover a lot of ground during a play usually, all right? Basketball court's only 94 feet. You don't really cover that much ground. Rugby and soccer, you're covering more ground. So it, it changes and gets bigger. Military, you could cover... How many kilometers in a day if you're doing an infill or an exfill for an op? Yeah. And you're carrying extra load. You're carrying all your ammo, all your comms, all your water, all your plates, your ruck. you got all this stuff on. It's between 40 and 70 pounds that you're carrying. And you got to get it in. you got to do the job. And then you got to get it out if you're doing an on-foot infill, exfill kind of thing. Yep. So you've got to be ready to cover some ground kind of thing. And the other thing is if you're... A special forces operator, you got to jump, and when you jump, you got to land mm-hmm. out of the plane. So you're not just jumping off of an eight foot ladder, <laughs> jumping off an eight foot ladder with a sixty or eighty pound vest on. That's right. Try that for a sec. <laughs> <laughs> so people are like, well, you know, you shouldn't do depth jumps, depth jumps with those guys. Uh, I don't, but you know, they're going to at some point because. Oh, no. You know, no. You land from a jump. you got to be ready for that. So what you have to do is you, you have to prepare them to do their job. And most of those guys love to train. In the military, you write it. And if they're an operator, they do it. Yep. There is no like, come on, you guys, let's go. You don't have to be a motivational coach. Nope. Truly a teacher coach. And, and I know at Eastern Michigan it's different than everybody else, and that's all you have to do with your guys, Ronnie. <laughs> I, I know at some universities – 
you know, it's like, come on, you guys, let's go. And they always have the option to show up and not show up and all this stuff. Yeah. So you really have less and less control. Right. So we had no control over those guys because of their job. They right. may miss a week, TDY. They may miss a month because they're in a school somewhere. Mm-hmm. So there really wasn't periodization, but you have to be, it's a cross between being a coach and being a personal trainer. You got to have a model, but you got to be able to adjust on the fly day to day. That's right. That's right. You know, one of the things that I've always leaned on you and, and you know, one of the things I respect the most about you has been your, your creativity, you know, through the years. And, and, you know, where does that come from? You know, how have you challenged yourself to be creative with your XLI selection and implements and all those types of things? I, I, I think I get bored easy and just like you do and anybody else does. And if I'm standing around in the room and I'm bored, I know – the, the, you know, and I love this stuff. Right. The players a lot of times don't really love lifting <laughs> weights and doing agilities. So if I'm bored, they've got to be bored. So I've got to figure out a way to keep this grind going, but to make it change. But not change just for change sakes. I got I have to change it, but in my mind, it's still got to fit a scientific basis. Right. And I remember talking to Russ and Dave Redding. Dave was a longtime strength coach, finally won the Super Bowl when he was with the Packers. When they won their last one, and Red Man was one of my kind of idols growing up, you know, and, and uh, he had been Russ's boss and just left when Russ hired me at Missouri back in the 80s. And so, you know, they're like, hey, just remember all that science stuff's nice, but you still got to coach people. So learn, you know, we all have biases. Mm-hmm. You know? And so it's like, are you coaching people or are you coaching science? Are you coaching people and there is no science? What do you do today? We're doing this and this and this because it kills them. Okay, but what's your training effect you're trying to get? Right. Well, it doesn't matter. We're just we're going to get great players, and we're going to kill them. We're, not kill them. You can't say that nowadays. We're going to crush them. <laughs> we're going to work them so hard that they're going to be so tough. And if they survive, we're going to win. Yeah. Mm, okay, that has its points. That has its place. But what's the training effect? Are you trying to make them faster, tougher? I remember talking to some of the guys. Yeah, we ran 24 110s. We ran 28 110s. And I was like, why? Right. I was talking to Dan Riley. Dan Riley spent 30 years in the NFL. He was with the Redskins when they won the Super Bowl. He was at Penn State before that right. with Turno. And then after that, he's with the Texans. And he goes, we only run, the most we ever run is 12 110s. And I said, why, coach? And he said, well, we just run 12 110s because player feedback. And I said, well, coach, if I went on player feedback, we'd only run two. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and he started, he started laughing. He said, he goes, no, no, no. He goes, remember now, I'm coaching men. I'm not coaching Young man, I'm coaching men, man. And I said, I got you. And he goes, we would see and we we would get feedback that they were heavy-legged the next day. And he goes, we're training guys to perform at the highest level on Sunday. Yeah. yeah. Not to be able to run 28 110s right, or right. 16 110s. And I said, so your whole deal is preparing them for the sport. He goes, yeah, we don't have to qualify them. That's what our coaches do and our scouts and our GMs do. And I said, gotcha. And that was kind of like what happened in Special Forces. I don't have to make a guy tougher. If you go to Ranger School, Ranger School, Sears School, the Q course, you're pretty tough. Yeah. When you, when you got a higher kill count than, uh, you know, <laughs> your son does on Halo. That's right. You're pretty tough. So, you know, you, know, you, you, you want to treat those guys with respect. And yeah. it was it – was, honorable to be welcomed into their community and be able to suggest things to them and they'll, they'll say hey thanks coach yeah that was that was that was one of the highlights of my career so far no doubt no i agree with you 100 on that well man i know it's a saturday i know you're busy i want to you know we always end these things with a couple of resources so give, give me a quote that you either live by or that you have plastered up in the, the house somewhere this is one I tell young coaches, and it's it's uh, it's not. I'm going to clean it up a little bit for you. <laughs> but um, there's three kind of animals, three kind of horses that you lead to water. Some you just lead to water and turn them loose, and they they they, they just take off. And it, they're they're a blessing to coach, and they're fun to work with. And some of them you have to kind of you know you got to kind of show them how to drink the water, and you got to put some water in their mouth, and then they they catch on. They're maybe not as mature and they don't understand what work brings them. But those guys are also a blessing to work with. But some of them, they, 
They want you to hold their head underwater and go around back and suck start them. <laughs> I'm not big on coaching that guy anymore. You know, I don't care how talented he is. Right. You know, everybody has to work and be part of the team. So that would be one of my quotes that I, <laughs> that I kind of go with. You know, surround yourself with those, horse, those first two kind of horses. Because yeah. you get too many of those third kind of horses, you're going to be loading up the U-Haul again. You're going to be moving. No, and no. I know you can't control it, but you got to figure out some way to impact it. No, no. So that would be one thing. The, uh, you said one of the books I've read is uh, yeah. Sports Gene by Mike Epstein. That was yeah. the last one I read. The, the, uh, David Coyle wrote one called Talent Code. Yep. That was a good book. And then you go back into the 90s, you know, and some of the coaches out there listen like, oh, 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 oh. first grade, 90, you know, that's, that's fine. There was a book called Taboo. Taboo was written, and it was about the same thing. It was about the influence of genetics, not color, not race genetics on athletic ability and if you're if you're from Ireland England or the, the eastern excuse me the western part of Europe your chance of being a great speed strength athlete is not very good mm-hmm. <laughs> so just deal with it if you know you're Irish Welsh English or uh, and that's your genetic history you know French uh, you, you're just not going to be a great street, speed strength athlete in what we look at in the in our elite world of sport. Right. What about um, you know a, a website that you maybe go to regularly, or a, as well as a, uh, any kind of technology you use with your athletes, an app or, or, or a device or something? You, well, for me, it, it just I'm not. This is not a commercial because it's it's free. Yeah, I have yeah. CoachRobRogers.com. Yep. Yeah. It's R O B B R O G E R S dot com, and I just put stuff on there as I feel like it. Right. I, I'm not a businessman. I got to put something up every day. I'm selling you this. I'm a teacher and a coach. So just like this show, this is an informational show. My deal is an informational deal, and it's it's stuff you can download, go sit down and read in ten minutes, five minutes, and and hopefully make an impact on your players or give you a way to hmm, think about stuff. Yeah. Dealing with uh, our athletes that we deal with. Or uh, dealing with the first responders or the tactical guys, they're always wanting workouts, and a lot of them are going to CrossFit, and it's it's it, you know it's a good circuit, but the thing is there are some real holes in their circuits. You know, a lot of front side loading, a lot of slope shouldered stuff, which we're already fighting anyway with our culture, and especially with our military guys, push ups, and then go sit down on the computer four hours. <laughs> so, so we gave them a lot. We always have them go to XL Athlete. And with those guys, because you can download tons of workouts and they're built for coaches and athletes. Yeah. It's not a culture of, I'm going to do a 20 minute circuit and lay on the ground and, and, you know, my work capacity, I can go 20 minutes, but if I have to go 22, forget it, I'm done. So you know, <laughs> there was, it's, it's a little bit different thing. So that of course, coach, uh, strengthcoach.com with Mike Boyle's deal, but you got to pay for that. So, uh, you know, yeah. the free ones are that one, um, XL athlete, uh, trying to think there's two or three others that I look at, but I can't think of what their names are right now. So, yeah. you know, it's just, my thing is just, it, it, you get information from tons of different spot places. Dave Ellis for nutrition on Facebook is always loading up studies. Yep. That's where I get a lot of my nutritional information from Dave being nice enough to just, you know, so just dumb. put that stuff up there. And you yep. look at it and you're like, oh, okay. Because, you know, most studies are a bunch of, you know, fraternity guys that weren't too hammered to show up for three or six or nine or 12 weeks and do something. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of that study stuff I was not real big on, but it's changed over the last few years yeah. now where we're starting to get some real information from the science community that's not built on trying to sell something. It was built on actually what's this information and how does it work. So oh, I agree. I agree. Well, brother, I appreciate you coming on, man. You've been such a great friend to me and, and done so much for this field as well. So thanks so much for, for doing this. Oh, it's an honor. And I, you know, it's anytime we get together, it's always good to see and us hang out and talk coaching and drink a, a milkshake or something. No doubt. Man. All right. That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors, EliteForm.com and IgnitionAPG.com for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out RonMcKeefree.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefree's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefree in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefrey can be found on Twitter at rmckeefrey. 
on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash Ron dot McKeefery. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk.